Semi-arid Australia. I'm here to tell you all about it, the nutrient deficiencies in the soil there, and the fact that it could be a better carbon sink than rainforest in the future. So listen up kids, because you're in for a wild ride. Australia. Known by most as the Great Outback, red sandy deserts fringed by beautiful beaches with wacky animals like kangaroos and poisonous critters. What people consider the outback is actually known as rangelands, which account for 81% of the national land area. A rangeland is broadly defined by the Department of Environment and Energy as areas where the rainfall is too low or unreliable to support regular cropping. Hi, my name is Kay McClendon and I'm here to bring to you a breaking news broadcast in regards to Australia. 70% of the Australian continent is covered by semi-arid or arid zones, known as rangelands. The semi-arid zone is defined as areas that only receive 250 to 300 millimetres of annual rainfall, while arid is regarded as zones that receive less than 250 millimetres of annual rainfall. 80% of the continent is covered by thick, ancient red-coloured regolith. It's flat, old and dry the driest inhabited continent in the world. Australian ecosystems are vastly different to anywhere else on Earth. However, Australia also has very nutrient-poor soils, particularly in the semi-arid and arid zones, which as we now know covers 70% of Australia, so the majority of the continent. So semi-arid, you might ask, what is it used for? Surely something if it covers so much land area. And you're right agriculture. Semi-arid can't really support regular cropping, but it is still used in some areas for this purpose. On the most part, semi-arid rangelands are used to graze introduced animals, cows and sheep. This grazing has had a profoundly negative impact on the soils of semi-arid Australia through the way of soil compaction, removal of native vegetation, destruction of biological soil crops, just to name a few. This grazing pressure doesn't just come from cows and sheep, Feral goats run amok around semi-arid, as well as the native herbivores. So the total grazing pressure, or TGP, is quite significant in semi-arid Australia. Intense grazing pressure hasn't just decimated the vegetation, destroyed the biological soil crust and compacted the soil, but has also had a large impact on the global carbon cycle. Carbon. Forged in the heart of the old stars, the fourth most prolific element in the universe. It is mostly stored in rocks, but is also found in the ocean, atmosphere, soil, plants and fossil fuels. The carbon cycle refers to the flow of carbon in between all of these reservoirs. A shift out of one reservoir increases carbon in the others. Anything that puts carbon into the atmosphere contributes to global warming. With emissions from fossil fuels and land use changes now exceeding 10 billion petagrams or tonnes of carbon per year, it is time to turn to our semi-arid rangelands that could become crucial in the global carbon cycle in the future. Exclusion of herbivores from areas of semi-arid may become an important management tool to allow for an increase in carbon sequestration and further a significant impact on the global carbon cycle. Thank you for listening. I've been Kate McLennan and I hope to speak to you soon. So let's talk about Australian soils. Ah, oh, the soils of Australia. My favourite. Now, Australian soils are vastly different to North America and Europe. Australian soils are old, weathered, with low fertility, susceptible to erosion, compaction, seasonal waterlogging, and salinity. Our soils are older and have been exposed to constant weathering. In fact, large areas of Australia, particularly this arid and semi-arid regions, which I hear you've heard about, have experienced millions of years of in situ, or I guess local weathering, which has led to depleted nutrients to depth in our soils. Now, it says here that it's important to stress our ancient soils were depleted prior to European agricultural practices, but in my opinion, they haven't really helped either way. Now, one of the major environmental themes warranting interest in Australian deserts or semi-arid and arid zones, is the infertility of soil. Now, that's a lack of nutrients, not like the soil can't have babies. It is a well-accepted theme that Australian soils in general have very low phosphate content. 
and this high proportion of nutrient-poor soils is actually quite unique to this old country. Ah, phosphorus, what a magical element. It is perhaps the key element in pedogenesis. Now don't freak out, pedogenesis is simply the process by which soil is formed. The reason for its importance is that it is supplied almost exclusively by the parent material of unfertilized soils. So basically, phosphorus comes from rock weathering. Most of Australia's soils have 10 to 400 parts per million of phosphorus, some as little as one parts per million, mostly unsuitable for agriculture without intensive fertilization. Now, a fun fact about phosphorus is that it is easily bound to lateritic compounds, things like calcium, iron, and aluminium. So the presence of these actually intensifies poor phosphorus status, and laterite is extremely common in the drought within semi-arid and arid zones. So semi-arid soils are peat efficient for introduced pasture use and require huge inputs of phosphorus fertilizer for this agricultural purpose, which is why they're typically just used as grazing lands. Now phosphorus isn't the only limiting nutrient in the environment, the lack of it actually limits the growth of green plants and nitrogen fixing organisms, so the level of soil nitrogen also becomes depleted. Now, recent evidence from a couple of scientists called Bennett and Adams in 2001 highlighted that neither phosphorus nor nitrogen had consistently limited the growth of native grasses in semi-arid Australia. It, they also found that nutrient limitations were not always consistent within and between uh, semi-arid vegetation communities. They also found that native species were more limited by nitrogen while introduced were limited by phosphorus. And it has been shown that Australia has low phosphorus concentrations, but plants native to Australia possess a range of adaptations to maintain adequate phosphorus despite the limitation. Plants native to Australia have thrived for millions of years without the benefit of phosphorus fertilizers. So it doesn't really make sense to bring in all these introduced crops and chuck a whole bunch of fertilizer on. So Australia has comparably low phosphorus concentration in its soil. But as put by Cumin in 2017, most of the soil can't really be declared as fertile or infertile because a surprisingly large amount of Australian soil is in the moderate range of phosphorus. What we do know that is that in particular, arid and semi-arid regions have comparably low phosphorus levels and introduced species, like all the crops the Europeans have kindly brought here for us, cannot survive. So either farmers have to dump huge amounts of fertiliser or it simply becomes a giant grazing field for sheep and cattle, which is the primary solution. The lack of water is simply too great to make it an astonishing agricultural resource. Basically what all this means is that semi-arid and arid lands aren't really that suitable to use for cropping, so most of it is used for grazing, which is also an important agricultural resource. But this doesn't mean semi-arid isn't still integral to Australia and the world. Another little side note, global reserves of phosphorus suitable for fertiliser manufacture are being depleted, meaning that, meaning there is a need to develop crops less reliant on the application of fertiliser in semi-arid lands, or focus more on developing semi-arid as a huge carbon sink to assist in the global carbon cycle and hopefully mitigate climate change. So let's quickly talk about carbon sequestration in semi-arid areas. So globally, rangelands account for 50% of the world's land mass and thus provide a key role in mitigating climate change. They show potential to store huge amounts of carbon in the soil and the biomass. As we know, 81% of Australia is a rangeland and most of this is semi-arid and arid areas, so it's probably quite important. Forget phosphorus. Soil organic carbon, or SOC, is the most important indicator of soil fertility. Now, by this point in the video, if you don't realise it's semi-arid, isn't all that productive, please re-watch the video. <laughs> so, lower productivity usually means lower carbon flux, right? Well, not really. Semi-arid lands store more than 25% of global terrestrial carbon, making it a pretty important carbon sink, or as you might know from this video, a reservoir. In 2011, 51% of the global net carbon sink was attributed to only three semi-arid regions, Australia, Southern Africa, and temperate South America. Now remember, the carbon cycle refers to the flow of carbon between global reservoirs, like the ocean and soil. Carbon itself is vital for three reasons. The first reason is that it provides a structure of life for everything on the planet, equating to 50% of the dry weight of all living things. 
Secondly, the flow of carbon through the cycle equates to the metabolism of all human, natural and industrial systems. Thirdly, fossil fuels of course. Carbon forms two important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. These contribute beneficially to a natural process creating an important layer that retains heat, known as the greenhouse effect. Basically allowing for life to exist on Earth and without it we wouldn't be here. The problem with us is that our desire for fuel and electricity and power means excess amounts of these gases, carbon dioxide and methane, are being released, enhancing the greenhouse effects and dangerously increasing the Earth's temperature. As we know, it is called global warming. With emissions from fossil fuels and land use changes now exceeding 10 billion petagrams or tonnes of carbon per year, it is time to turn to our semi-arid rangelands that could become crucial in the global carbon cycle in the future. The problem lies in the extensive grazing that semi-arid Australia suffers, which ultimately leads to a loss in soil carbon from erosion and compaction. The only way to promote more carbon sequestration into the soils is to promote woody biomass and permanent native ground cover. Witt et al. in 2011 found that if 50% of the Mulga bioregion found across semi-arid Australia were managed through control of herbivore grazing, 2.3 megatons of carbon dioxide per year would be sequestered through the soil alone. If this were combined with all the living and dead woody biomass, the potential for sequestration is 11.6 to 14 megatons of carbon dioxide per year. So to wrap it all up, uh, let's just recap. So semi-arid is classified as receiving between 250 and 300 millimetres of annual rainfall. 70% of Australia is classified as semi-arid or arid, and this is also classified as rangelands. Australia is flat, old and dry, the driest inhabited continent in the world, and our soils have been deemed as having very low fertility. And this uh, is due to the long period of weathering over millennia, leading to a lack of phosphorus, particularly in semi-arid and arid Australia. Although recent findings do show that our native plants are only limited by nitrogen, not phosphorus, as they have evolved to survive in our depleted soils. But introduced crops, um, they really suffer with the lack of phosphorus. So the majority of semi-arid has been declared as grazing lands due to the unsuitable match with cropping. However, this extensive grazing is negatively impacting um, the potential positive effect that semi-arid Australia could have on the global carbon cycle in carbon sequestration. The carbon cycle is vital to the functioning of the entire universe. Um, and over 50% of the net global carbon sink can be attributed to just three semi-arid zones, including Australia. So, what is the future of this kind of research? The future lies in the fact that our knowledge of soil infertility and the importance of semi-arid Australia as an integral carbon sink is incomplete and really lacking. Um, so, there's limited knowledge about how to go about improving the problems or whether they need to be improved at all. Depletion of such nutrients as phosphorus and carbon does pose a great challenge, but it also holds great potential for sustainable agriculture in semi-arid and wider Australia in the near future. So thanks for listening, guys, um, and I hope you enjoy your day.